So uh, Michelle just uh, started the recording, and yeah, I, I would love to. Uh, I would like to welcome you all uh, to today's session. Uh, and as you must definitely know, we are going to talk about cats, and so excited about it. And and the first uh, speaker is uh, Nieves Pascual Soler from the Valencian International University. And um, he will be talking about uh, cat addicts, construction and deconstructing animality in pet treat advertisement. So uh, yeah, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Alejandro. So as I promised, I will try to stick to the 15 minutes. Um, cat addicts, uh, constructing and deconstructing animality in uh, pet cat treat advertisements. So I want to start with um, some data. Uh, the U.S. market is the biggest in the world for pet food, and this is not surprising considering that according to the 2021-2022 National Pet Owners Survey conducted by the American Pet Products Association, 70% of U.S. households have pets. In 2020, Americans spent $103 billion on dollars on pet supplies. 15 years ago, it was just uh, $34 billion. And out of those $103 billion, $42 billion went to food and treats. So my purpose is to briefly examine the context, impact on consumers, and cultural assumptions of cat treat advertising in the U.S. in order to investigate how food is coded and decoded by advertisers and consumers and the meanings attached to the relationships that food creates. And I use a textual analysis methodology to examine human-animal relations through food in Mars, Whiskas, Tentations, Cat, Tree Packages as advertisements. And um, why Mars, Whiskas, Tentations? Well, I choose Mars because of its size and its success in the market. This is a company based in Virginia. It manufactures food and snacks and is ranked as the sixth largest privately owned company in the U.S. And its number, brand, and its number one brand is Whiskas, with Temptations holding 42% share. And why advertising is the second question. Well, due to the growth of the market of food for companion animals and the increase in advertising it has led to. Marketing of treats to cats contributes to conceptualizations about them and relationships between them and humans. Uh, however, in spite of this, little research has been conducted in this area. Now, one exception, let me see if I can move this. One exception is the 1996 study by Barbara Stern in textual analysis in advertising research, construction, and the construction of meaning. So taking as point of departure, the idea that advertisements operate as narrative fictions, Stern uses literary analysis to deconstruct their messages. In her view, the work done so far in the field has focused solely on modernist criticism, and she proposes, therefore, to incorporate the postmodern insights of deconstruction originally formulated by Jacques Derrida. And to that purpose, she develops a three step method that she tests on a 1992 advertisement of that food featuring two dogs happily munching on pepperoni and sausages treats. The method consists of um, First, analyzing the literary structure of the advertising text. Then she constructs a meaning based on her own reading. And then she deconstructs the messages underlying the text. She says, and I quote, just as deconstructed critics engage in the reading uh, presences only to expose the underlying absences, unquote, Stern investigates the gaps, the inconsistencies, and the contradictions in an exemplar text in order to uncover assumptions, and I quote again, uncover assumptions likely to discomfort readers by shaking them out of complacency. Stern examines the amusing conflict the two dogs are involved in and the happy ending of the narrative because in the end, the dogs are going to eat the snacks. Thereupon, she affirms that the key to the exemplar's plot type is a comedy. She further notes that this language is fed, and you see that there, with the poetic devices of fables, a genre of childhood literature that contains fantasy elements used in classical times to teach children and native audiences lessons about appropriate behavior. Then she constructs a meaning, and she says, by representing dogs as children at play, 
who behave as though they were good children. The brand persuades dog owners to treat their pets as children. Finally, this message is deconstructed around a hierarchy human animal that privileges the human by suppressing the animal. Stern concludes that, and I quote, animal happiness is defined in human terms, and that the exemplar addresses the fear that pets behave like dangerous wild animals instead of like controllable children. In essence, she says, and I quote again, the dark side of this hierarchy is that human mastery is often motivated by fear of the oppressed. That is, humans fear the uncontrolled power of dogs who are capable of unprovoked aggressive behavior. Through treats, through food, the powerful master civilizes the disempowered pet. Stern movement from modernist to postmodernist theory does not address the postmodern perspective on the animal question, investigated by Kerry Wolf in Animal Rights in 2003, where he remarks on the difference between modernist and postmodernist attitudes towards animals. In his view, in modernism, we repudiate animality, while postmodernism is characterized by a most ambivalent relation to the animal that combines fear of animality with the guilt of oppression. Other scholars like Derrida in The Animal That Therefore I Am, David Nibert in Pets Profitable and Disposable, Erika Fatsch in Pets, and Catherine Greer in Pets in America, A History, have investigated our current ambivalence towards companion animals. Specifically, Greer has tackled food as a way to maneuver the tension between the apparent desire of American pet owners to experience animality and I got lost myself, uh, through contact with pets and an equally apparent trend towards increasing control of our pets' lives, including their behavior, their biology, and their routines, precisely because we want to bind them so closely to us. Out of love, owners regulate the actions of pets and in the same movement work to celebrate the animal by feeding them natural foods. She further explains that a careful perusal of pet store shelves makes apparent that some pet owners are adherent of natural approaches to their pets. It so happens, however, that as we bring animals closer to us, their normal behaviors can seem intolerable, and so we use natural foods to channel the normal behavior of animals. In the case of uh, treats, the sense of guilt increases. As indicated in the report Pet Food in the US, an important theme in treats now is guilt free. When pet owners, and I am quoting from the report, when pet owners can give a pet snacks without guilt, they can feel good about offering small indulgences, unquote. The problem is that it's not small indulgences marketers are after, but big ones. My point is that in the advertisements that I'm going to present you here at hand, cats go natural. Let me see here. To assuage the guilt of repression, while treats are used for training, consumption of treats is advertised as the cat's symbolic return to the freedom and independence of hunting. To assuage the guilt of indulgence, treats have natural features and are healthy. So by feeding our cats treats, these treats specifically, we return animals to nature. The issue is that the nature we return them to is too cultural. The animality we liberate is all too human. And in the end, the enticement of freedom in the advertising text leads to addiction. As in advertisements of junk food, alcohol, and cigarettes, freedom is equated to addiction. Following up on Stern, I examine first the narrative on the packages. So I go to the front, to the cover, to the front of the package. And um, there's some um, Temptations offers the 32 varieties traits. I'm just bringing two examples here. Then I construct the meaning of the advertising text using 229 customer reviews posted on the websites of Petco and PetSmart in 2019. And then I deconstruct the gut, the absence. So I try to study the undertext. So um, this is the front. And you see the lively colors here and the cartoon images with the figure of the cat who is under the animal, that is food. And the cat is playing, the cat is on an adventure, but he's also hunting. So there's this confusion between work and leisure. The child, and I think this is interesting, is also a boy. This is interesting, as I said, because according to Carol Adams and Josephine Donovan, while domestic 
domestic animals are feminized, wild animals are perceived as masculine. And the illustration here on, on the front is explained at the back. Before we move to the back, I just want to emphasize this uh, here. I don't know if you see my arrow, but uh, on the bottom, you see a sign, a note saying that it's under two calories per treat. This is important because currently there's an a cat obesity, obesity epidemic in the United States and 59% of domestic cats are, are obese or overweight. So we go to the, uh, to the back. And um, the first thing I want to mention is that although products that are identified as treats are not required <clears throat> excuse me, by the Association of American Feed Control Officials to post a statement of nutritional adequacy on their labels. Health notices appear on every temptations package. So you have here the ingredients, the guaranteed analysis, and the note that says that these treats are 100% nutritionally complete and balanced. Then you have the narrative. It's a very short narrative. The cat is the main character. The narrative is a comedy. <laughs> and it takes the form of an adventure story where the cat is going to triumph over the animal that is food and over the human who eventually will succumb to the cat's demands. And note the playfulness in the language. And you see some exclamations of joy here, but if you compare this package to other packages, there's a lot of onomatopoeias and ellipses, alliterations, neologisms. And also interesting is when you go to the end of the narrative is this demand of the cat at the end of the narrative. Give me some temptations. I'm going to try to move to the next one. This is another example. I want to emphasize this idea of uh, demanding here at the end. Yes, give me some temptations. So um, although the demand for food is often softened with formulas of politeness and cliches as applications, so at times we have the cat saying, please allow me the pleasure, it is still expressed in the imperative. Pass me the temptations, land me some temptations, just give them here. He loves the food so much that he forgets about manners. And we can use, the, the implication here is that we can use that love of the cat for the foot to train the cat. The logo of the brand is here. Just shake the pack and they will come running. They love these treats so much that you can certainly use them to, to control the cat. Um, be that as, um, well, be that as, as it might, the guilt of greediness because we have a, a cat that is constantly demanding food and he has a hearty appetite. So the guilt of greediness is assuaged by the knowledge that the treats are nutritious. I'm gonna move. And under two calories. I want to insist on this idea that treats are 100% nutritionally complete. They are under two calories and because they are under two calories, you can treat your cat every day. And not only that, you can treat cats again and again and again because they are nutritious and they are under two calories. So very quickly, I want to move on to this uh, respondents. I use, as I said, 229 customer reviews of the products that were posted on Petco and PetSmart. I use thematic analysis and um, to measure how these messages resonated with consumers, I, I used uh, repetition. If we look at the themes that I selected and the themes there, I want to emphasize the uh, theme number seven, which is gladony, because uh, 48 cats have uh, ravenous appetites and are ready to do anything to get their temptations, do belly rolls, tap the heads of humans, climb to the table and resort to what one respondent calls criminal tactics. They steal the treats and shred the packages to pieces. Of interest as well is the association of gluttony with addiction here is uh, theme number eight and theme number nine. And the description of temptations as kitty crack, heroin, drug, and kitty canny. Other terms associated with addiction are obsession, psychosis, craziness, and they present a high frequency of occurrence. Love is uppermost, is theme number five. Is uppermost here is love of the cat for treats and love of the keepers for their cats, hence my title, Cat Addicts, so, which opens the question of who the addict is. Training, 
another important uh, theme and this training that is theme number 14 is associated to theme number six, which is the story of cats running when back is shaken. And interestingly, health, which is theme number two, is important but health for respondents is not a priority. Keepers know that this is junk food. They know the, the ingredients. They are not thrilled about the ingredients. They know that the product is addictive and still they feed their cats with temptations. And just to conclude, to me, the gap in the text in these uh, advertisements is guilt. The undertext is addiction. So with these trees, treats, we make our cats free turning them into addicts. There are several cat sites like Senior Cat Wellness, the cat site, podtracks.com, that have pointed out that temptations are addictive. And when you give your cat too many, the animal develops behavioral problems, such as aggression and begging. According to the scientific literature on cats with ravenous appetites and aggressively obsessed with food, these animals suffer from a psychogenic condition related to stress, feelings of anxiety, and dietary deficiencies. So I think that we need different types of texts to support different types of behavior, where the relationship between the human and non-human is not hierarchical, is more complementary, more interrelated. So maybe when it comes to advertisements, we are still dealing with postmodernist texts, and we need to move into post-humanist texts. So that was my presentation. I hope Alejandro is stuck to the 15 minutes. Yeah, it was. Uh, so yes, thank you so much for, for your perfect timing and, and for this beautiful, uh, absolutely interesting presentation, really. Um, so for, uh, I forgot to mention that before, but uh, so all the Q&A and everything will be at the end of, uh, of these uh, presentations. But um, if you want to uh, start asking questions, uh, you can uh, basically uh, put them on the chat. And now, uh, our second speaker is uh, Esther Diaz Morillo uh, from the uh, UNES, from the uh, uh, National uh, Distance Education here in Spain. And uh, she will be talking uh, uh, about, well, the, the title of, of her talk is uh, There's How You Address a Cat, the portrayal uh, of anthropomorphic colleagues in Lori Weber's Cats. So, uh, yeah, everything uh, works fine uh, with your presentation. So, you know, whenever you. you are ready. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Alejandro, for your introduction and thank you for this opportunity. So that's how you address a cat, the portrayal of anthropomorphic felines in Lloyd's Weather cats. That's going to be my presentation today. Oh, sorry, let's see if it works. There you go you have an outline of what I'm going to be talking about today. And so, um, Diaz Elliott's celebrated collection of poems or person's book of practical accounts was first published in 1939, but has since then seen a continued presence on stage and in illustrated editions. This whimsical poetry collection has gained more popularity due to the, its adaptation as an acclaimed and award-winning musical written by Andrew Lloyd Webber in, in 1981. But having run for 21 years in London and 18 years in New York, Cat set new records in musical productions. To this day, it remains the fourth longest running show in Broadway and the seventh longest running in the West End. The musical is characterized by its being told through music, ranging from diverse styles and no dialogue in between songs, and by the importance of dance. Its recent cinematographic version, directed by Tom Hooper in 2019, shocked both audience and critics with its disturbing CGI effects, as we shall see. Now, in Nadia's poems, there is a strong characterization of the felines who have names, descriptions, and strong and eccentric personalities, which render them quite apt to be adapted into a stage production. Most of them perform human actions as in a giant game of role play. There is a psychological characterization of the cats, usually presented in dramatic situations, in battles, thefts, uh, performing at the theater. The poem of the Son of the Jellicles presents this world inhabited by cats with human traits and attitudes. Each poem introduces a cat and their characteristics, evocative or dramatic monologues, which Eliot employed in some of his famous early poems. The musical will further reinforce the concept of the dramatic monologue by transforming many of these character portraits into first person lyrics making them true dramatic monologues in which the felines introduce themselves in order to explain the reason why they are worthy of going up the heavy side layer. 
An example uh, is manga Jerin Rafajisa, whose modifications can be observed on, on screen. But in addition to that, uh, changes of speaker are moreover indicated by a metrical variation in the poem. In Baiten's words, and I quote, Elliot do the cuts in different voices, end of quote. As regard characterization in the musical production, this is achieved through costumes and intricate uh, makeup for its purpose is to establish their personality at first sight. Each cut has their own individual makeup plot, costume and wigs, and no prosthetics are used. Their style is very much in line with their 70s and 80s aesthetics between the new wave and punk. Cats are presented in a lively manner and many of them have mischievous personalities. Music uh, and even dance also contributes to the characterization of the felines, as there is a different type of music for each of them. Gas the theater cat has a nostalgic song reminiscent of the musical atmosphere as an indication of the cat's age in classical training. Mr. Mistopheles and the Rumtum Tagger are rock numbers, uh, whilst all Deuteronomy presents a lullaby style song, which almost turns into an anthem as a hint to re the, the relevance of the character within the musical. The all can be cat includes a tap dancing routine, a style reminiscent of the 30s, and Macavity, the mystery card, is a central number whose choreography reminds us of both Fussy, and this is just to name a few examples. But as pointed out by Sirepilus, um, the use of pastiche in the, in the musicalization of the poems creates some sort of quickly grabs musical characterization for each cut type, a musical image that communicates directly to the audience each character's defining features. Body movement and dance is what further characterizes these cuts, which are portrayed accordingly as sensual, playful, mysterious, shabby, etc. Stage designer Dion Napier offers us then a fantastic anthropomorphic feline world where cats, in a quote from Syropolis, move in a combination of animal movement, acrobatics, and various dancing styles, sing in a vast array of musical pastiches, and speak in a distinctively um, Victorian and Edwardian language, which contrasts in a playful, dissonant way with the get of fabulous corporeal stylization, leg warmers, act warmers, pan haircuts, new way makeup. End of quote. Um, so, when Elliot writes for children, he fills his verses with plenty of action. In Practical Cats, we have a plethora of felines doing things, dancing, performing, conducting, stealing. Here, Elliot is extremely playful in the way he portrays his characters and in the way he writes about them. According to Baytian, these are poems, and I quote, that revel in the pleasures of play, end of quote. But it is not only what he writes about these cats, but also how he does it. That is to say, language is playful as well. And it uses whimsical rhymes, refrains, and nonsense poetry, and the author plays with language and sounds to invent new words and create names, as you can see on screen. In addition to that, Eliot, the writer in the 1930s, employs an English reminiscent of the Victorian and Edwardian eras in its instruction and lexicon. Now, playfulness is exploited throughout the musical production too. Characters are presented in a lively manner, and many of them have mysterious personalities. Their songs and dances are playful as well. But above all, it is a stage which becomes a playground for all these felines. Napier designed a theatrical space which would portray the cast universe in a reduced location quite appropriate for an Elias poetry adaptation, a wasteland, a sort of urban refuse dump full of the debris of human society. Films seen on stage are cut scale, that is to say. From the audience perspective, they look huge, so as to have viewers enter into the cast perspective. The design of the stage becomes an exciting place for the cast to discover new things and to use and modify according to the purposes, interacting with props on stage throughout the performance. So the space on the stage shows the humorous side of the musical show, as well as providing enough space for dancing. As the stage is transformed into an all-encompassing atmosphere with this anthropomorphic line seeing, dance, crawl, and appear from any place of the theatrical space. So what we see is an encircled happy space where we see uh, a post-human, neo-primitive mutant body, as what we see is a blend of the feline movements with challenging choreography and acrobatics, and therefore once more a discordant and playful display of the neo-primitive of animal with a hip due to the makeup and costumes, as well as a dissonance between the ultra-modern looks on stage and the old-fashioned language they use. It is all a play of contrasts. We see that the most favorite technique in cats is the college, for we can find several combinations and blends which reunite styles that otherwise would be impossible to recognize. Um, so in cats, uh, we can see how dancers on a stage must be impersonal in the sense that they assume the personality of a cat. 
they are not even human anymore. Curiously enough, the movement of the actors on stage has been referred to as neo-primitive by Syropolis. During rehearsals, performers in the musical had to take part in Cal School, which you can see on screen, where they learned how to portray the movements and physicality of a cat. Through polarization and mimics, they learned to behave like felines so as to be able to perform on stage, incorporating all these cat-like manners. It involved things such as sniffing, scratching, stretching, cleaning themselves on, four, on all fours, how to move the spine and how to use their hands as, as paws, so that they incorporated these traits and mannerisms in the performance in order to create the anthropomorphic illusion by always keeping the personalities of their own feline characters. At the same time, in Lion's daunting choreography, they mix popular dances with on stage, rock, jazz, tap dancing, with more classical ballet. Regarded as an extremely challenging production to dance, the show pushed the performers to the limits with the dancing, acrobatic, and cat side behavior. It has been recognized um, cat is mainly a piece of physical theater, a corporeal spectacle in which a cat's essence is communicated vertically through movement. And that is why cats has been labeled as a dance musical. So consequently, cats implies the triumph of motion over emotion. According to Calum, in that sense, the mega musical can be compared to the blockbuster film in the film industry, where the aim is a total synesthetic experience. The purpose is not to make the audience identify with characters or plots, rather to indulge in the senses and transmit a feeling of euphoria. In fact, it could be argued that the movie Cats was intended as a blockbuster by Universal, as it was a large budget production of a highly popular product, which was premiered at Christmas. But it ended up becoming a, fox, uh, of a box office bomb ravaged by uh, reviews and critics. As it lacks narrative and is delocalized, cast does not represent, it is devoid of referentiality, whether cultural or sociopolitical, which makes it a highly exportable product. So musical theater comes then nearer to commercial exploitation, to a commodity, as the show crosses boundaries and becomes the epitome of a globalized capitalist world functioning like multi uh, multinational franchises such as McDonald's. And that is how Cats was transformed into a commodity, a product to be marketed over and over again. So no wonder then that Hollywood thought it might be a good idea to make a cinematographic version of the musical adaptation. Directed by Tom Hooper in, 19, uh, in 2019, Cats the movie shocked both critics and audiences worldwide with the disturbing use of CGI effects. The movie is ranked 23rd of the Internet Movie Database charts of lowest rated movies. Um, the playfulness of the original and its poems and Lloyd Webber's musical is transformed into nightmarish images which haunt the, the viewer long after seeing the movie. Quite ironic to think that Walt Disney approached T.S. Eliot to talk about the possibility of adapting practical cats into an animated film, which Eliot declined, claiming that he refused to see his villains become pussycats or turn into cartoon cats. So the main issue with the movie adaptation, as pointed out by critics and audiences alike, is the fact that the movie does not show cats, but creepy feline humanoids full of digital effects, but which still maintain the human faces, feet, and hands, so that the actors are still clearly recognizable. Some of them even wear a perfect nail polish or the wedding rings. Um, tail and cat ears, as well as some facial hair and whiskers, are also added to their expressive faces which adds a sense to, of weirdness to it. That is to say, actors do not wear cat costumes, leotards and face paint as in the theatrical production. Um, instead, the cat fur is added digitally on them, transmogrifying the performance with what has been termed as digital fur technology. Most of the time, they even walk upright, resembling furry naked humans, but no genitals are shown, so they are kind of sexist creatures. The final result of the use of CGI is therefore uncanny and unsettling for most viewers. What we see on screen are feline human hybrids blurring the lines between the physical and animation, the animal and the human. Even the conga lines of mice and crocodiles dancing to Jenny and Idols have human faces in a very Kafkaian nightmare scene. To add food, uh, fuel to the fire, Jason Derulo's Rantam Tagger and Judy Dunch, gender flipped or Deuteronomy appear wearing what looks like coats made of animal fur. In fact, there is no explanation as to why some cats wear clothes and even shoes, while others simply do not. And then we have Taylor Swift, extremely sexualized for ballerina, who displays furry breasts and even wears high heels. Furthermore, much criticism focused on the fact that Francesca Hayward, a principal ballerina at the Royal Ballet in London, 
was cast, uh, was cast to play Victoria the White Cat. Hayward, who is a light-skinned black woman, is forced here not only to have white fur in the film, but also seems to wear white face makeup. So Hooper's cinematography version of Cats is then nothing less than imperfect, yet a perfect new addition to the hate watching phenomenon. So um, to conclude, Alias Pratik and Cats portray, as we have seen, extremely playful lines that are, they are strongly characterized and the author presents us with an array of protagonists with incredible abilities. Many are performers, dancers, actors, or magicians. As an adaptation of practical cast, in the musical production, characterization is mostly achieved through makeup and costumes, which is ultra modern and hip, but all through music and dance, employing different genres throughout the show. The performers, bodily movement, and dancing bestow this cast with varied characteristics, creating a blend of feline movements, daunting choreography, and acrobatics that leads to the display of a post-human body, mutant body on stage which looks near primitive, but trendy at the same time, due to the new wave looks. We are then visually transported into the feline world created by Elliot in his verses, a fantastical feline universe of almost sci-fi proportions, where anthropomorphic cats move, dance, and sing in different styles, combining the human and the feline. As a matter of fact, everything is very physical in this production. The attitudes of the feline characters are expressed in movement and through dance. For his past, the cinematographic version by Hooper presents instead feline humanoids made by a disturbing digital fur technology which transforms actors and performers into sexes and, and uncanny hybrids. The playfulness of the original Elliot's poems maintained by Lloyd Webber's musical is here lost in translation. We have seen there is a progression from the playful felines doing human actions in Elliot's poems to the performers who learn to become cats in the musical with an uh, um, I just uh, specialize in ultra modern aesthetic to the creation of an uncanny um, hybridity in the movie. These cats, and in all the adaptations, embody the popular itself, representing a contemporary mass culture phenomenon, and it definitely has it definitely has shown us how to and how not to address a cat. So, thank you very much. Thank you so I'm much. Going to uh, uh, even though the last images of the of the film uh, really made my eyes bleed again, I forgot. I have absolutely forgot. I know the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much. It was it was really thank interesting. You. And um, we're now turning to our last uh, speaker, uh, Emma. Hi, Emma. So um, uh, she um, um, she's uh, from the University of Castilla-La Mancha here in Spain as well. And uh, she will presenting a paper titled The Black Cat uh, in the Illustrated Spanish Imaginary. So the floor is yours. Uh, everything works fine. Suppose based on Alejandro's face, you also can't hear anything, right? No, I cannot. <laughs> I was I was about to say something. Um, so Gemma, we cannot uh, listen to you, which is a strange because uh, it worked before. It's not working. Okay, so um, what if you uh, leave the room and go back again? Maybe that works. I don't know. Can you, so can you hear us? Okay, great, that's, that's something good. So yeah, um, yeah, why don't you try leave the room and 
just uh, come here again. Uh, maybe that makes maybe that makes it work. Well, technical difficulties will always have them, so they are expected. here. Hi, Emma. No, we cannot hear you. No. Oh, okay. Uh, I have uh, no idea how to solve this, uh, Michelle. Uh, do you have any uh, insights or something, any solution to this? Uh, no, I mean, the, the only thing I can ask is, of course, what the, you, Emma, have multiple microphones. Uh, I.e. both on the lap, I don't know, one connected via, via USB and the laptop microphone or something like that. So you just have one. That's weird. Yeah. Uh, test the speaker microphone, you know, in the settings next to mute. So you can just test your own self. Uh, strange because it worked uh, just a few minutes ago. Um, so, Hemma, do you have like headphones? Like, I am okay. Try to disconnect and connect them again to try to because sometimes it just did you hear me now? Okay, perfect. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it works now. <laughs> Sorry, thank, thank you so much, Esther. Uh, for Thank you. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I will share my. I hope you can hear me now without incidents. Can you hear me now properly? Yes, yes, perfectly. Thank God. <laughs> okay. Um, I am deeply sorry for the inconvenience. So, good afternoon. Um, the, research, the research paper I am about to present focuses on one of Edgar Allan Poe's most renowned stories, The Black Cat, and its evolution as an illustrated text in Spanish editions from its beginnings to the current publications. So first of all, the choice of this tale is because the main character is in fact a cat, not a human, and the cat is the truly protagonist, and the cat molds the story and guides the, guides, sorry, the protagonist fate. So, Without further ado, the first edition, translated into Spanish language of the story, was published in 1866 in the literary magazine El Jardín, which we can see on the left, that was a weekly literary review. And the first illustrated edition is this, that was published in Spain, was entitled Historias Extraordinarias, and it was illustrated by Fernando Sumetra, who was a very famous Spanish artist of the moment. And it was, it was published, sorry, in 1877. So we can see, as I have said, the cover pages of both publications. And over the years, and since the publication of these two editions, the way in which artists and illustrator, illustrators, sorry, have depicted the story has evolved and, and has followed a series of specific artistic movements so we can see a clear evolution of the illustrated trajectory of the black cat in Spain. So first of all, we have here like the classical and customary representations because the artists, the artists, sorry, liked 
to show the hanging cat, but they also include general scenes or scenes of a more domestic nature without introducing overly violent or supernatural elements. As we can see here, sorry, this is, for example, what we can see on a screen and what we can find on late 20th, sorry, um, 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. And these illustration, illustrations represent the main character with his cat. I don't know if you know the story, but there's a main character who is a man and has a lot of pets. And one of these pets is a cat. We can see in the cat named Pluto in, on a screen on both illustrations. And this illustration represents the main character with his cat, with almost any violence, at least on the left, who belong, which belongs to Fernando Sumetra. And they are interacting in a, we can see, um, relaxed way. But here we can see the face of the cat who is a little bit upset. Um, these changes with the arrival of middle and late 20th century, when violence begins to appear in a gradually, gradually, sorry, and the representations of the cat being abused or killed or even killed are more common. However, the different artists try to give the representation a bolder look by trying new, new atmospheres and adding the cat as a true protagonist. That's what we can see on both illustrations. This belongs to Jose Segreyes and to Ramon Calcino. We can see that the date, dates are very far apart. And Jose Segreyes, for example, adds the cat on the top of the head of the dead woman, the dead wife of the protagonist. And the animal is opening his mouth in a very creepy way. And Calcina, for example, depicts the pigs and the cat being thro throwing um, uh, violently through the window during the fire that occurs in the tale. And all of the above give way to symbolic and, met and metaphysical illustrations because in the 20th century, we could see how the illustrators gave a different approach to the tale, but in the present, the different artists enjoy a special creative freedom. And that is what we can see uh, in the illustration we have in, on a screen. And first, we can see an extremely metaphysical depiction of the cat, who, which belongs to Mila de Cans, who is a Catalini Catalonian painter. painter sorry. Um, this, the cat is a silhouette and is linked with a cir circle and a line to the outside. So it has a very symbolic value. And, but for me, one of the most interesting representation of the cat belongs to Maria Espejo, who is a very young um, artist, Spanish artist, in which the animal appears on top of the chest of the narrator, who is sleeping uneasily, and the cat is looking directly to the spectator with a uh, very bright and scary eye. So this image is far cry for the, from the serenity, sorry, we observe in the first illustrations. So due to final considerations, the illustrated tra trajectory of the black cat in Spain, despite being one of the most, the most interesting ones eh, among all the Edgar Allan Poe tales and poems, it has received little attention from researchers. It is evident, therefore, the pictorial evolution of the story, which on the other hand, has adapted to the artistic currents of the moment, allowing the actors to enjoy greater interpretative freedom in recent years. It is undoubtedly, undoubtedly, sorry, this word is difficult, necessary to continue paying attention to both tales from an artistic and symbolic perspective, especially those whose protagonists are animals. So that was my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And I am deeply sorry for the for all the problems I have caused. Sorry. No worries. No worries. Thank you so much, uh, Gemma, uh, for, for the presentation. And uh, we are uh, perfectly on time, uh, I believe. So uh, now it's the, well, it's, now we are in the Q&A turn. Um, so I wonder if uh, anyone wants to uh, open the floor and ask something. Uh, does anyone have any any question? I do have 
some of them, but uh, I would like to be the last one. So, um, anyone wants to comment something on what we have uh, seen and hear today? If not, I will I will start if you don't uh, mind. Um, so um, uh, I will start with uh, Nieves because, uh, well, I truly uh, enjoyed uh, your presentation. It was uh, very interesting. And I was wondering, um, so at the end of your presentation, you said uh, something about uh, moving towards a more post-human uh, way of advertising, uh, I guess. Uh, so uh, I was wondering if you have any idea of how we can conceptualize that type of was human advertisement because for me at least uh, uh, it, like linking these two concepts seems very strange uh, because because humanism is uh, I guess rooted in a so in in, in in a series of notions that you know uh, will make you uh, very reluctant to uh, advertise animals I guess uh, in terms of um, trying to well to basically equalize yourself or or, or equalize humanity uh, to non-humanity. So I was wondering, um, ethically at least, or from from an, from an ethical perspective, if there is any way, or if you if in your research you have found a way to um, conceptualize this sense of post-human advertisement or um, or ways to sell, I guess. Uh, food. Thank you, Alejandro. That's um, that's a very interesting question. My idea was not, I, I didn't want to tackle post-humanism. I was um, more pointing to, to the possibility of making the human and non-human more integrated into a non-hierarchical relationship whereby we need to suppress the animal in order to position ourselves at the top. So post-humanism, maybe I was understanding it too broadly in terms of uh, in terms of this vertical relationship, I have not seen um, I have not seen uh, commercials or advertisements of food wherein this uh, verticality is um, is illustrated or is used or is expressed. I think that we have. My point is that we have not moved that far from the 1990s in which we wanted to control the animal. We want to control the animal. Still, we want to control the animal, but we we are uh, traumatized by our own guilt, right? But we haven't, we haven't moved forward. So my, my idea was precisely that, that I don't know how to do it. Um, if I knew, maybe I would be rich doing these kind of commercials, but, uh, yeah, but the idea is trying not to suppress the animal all the time to position ourselves on top. I have not seen maybe the, uh, the, uh, the participants here, maybe they have seen some, some kind of uh, commercials or advertisements in which this happens. I have not. And then the, uh, I was dealing with the packages themselves, but the, uh, commercials, are amazing what these people are doing with the commercials. They, they are, they are, the animals are clearly addicted there and they are clearly used in those, in those commercials. I think the commercials are brilliant, but they are very irritating as well and very demeaning for, for the companion animals. So thank you for the question. Yeah. And I will think, I will think about, about possibilities here. Yeah, I think it, I think it is. It must be complicated, actually. Um, but that actually uh, that you that you mentioned before uh, links to to um, uh, one of the or some of the images you were showing because uh, you were mentioning uh, things like uh, guilt, for instance, and 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 uh, I don't know if I remember correctly, but you also mentioned issues such as cruelty free and and so all these basically. Those all those terms that uh, eventually operate as uh, as mechanisms that uh, you know uh, make people buy this thing out of out of not feeling uh, guilty about uh, exercising some power over animals. And it's interesting because in those images, what we see is this 
uh, return to nature that is also based on cruelty. So we see this cat uh, hunting a, a chicken, I think, uh, which is interesting because if, if that was made in nature, that would be absolutely cruel. That would be absolutely uh, painful, right? Uh, so this is not, I guess this is not a question. It's just something that, uh, you know, uh, made me think uh, whenever you were uh, showing those uh, those ads, it's like, well, uh, you feel uh, uh, or you want to uh, um, perch, I guess, your guilt against cats or against power structures over cats, but then the chicken and the fish and the shrimp and all the other animals that, well, you just uh, don't care as a consumer uh, or as a predicted consumer uh, in, in these in this ads. Yeah, yeah, you are absolutely right. And we love our accompanying animals, but what kind of love is that when you know that the product is not that good, but it happens with humans as well. We buy snacks. It's the same kind of publicity. It's the same kind of, of mechanisms and strategies and um, for the consumption of cigarettes as well. The Marlboro, Marlboro man on the mountain is smoking and enjoying his freedom when that freedom indeed is, is addiction, right? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, and um, I also have some uh, questions for uh, for Steph. Uh, let me check my notes just a second because I wrote like uh, three pages. And so um, you also, uh, so I want to continue the conversation uh, with uh, posthumanism or on posthumanism here uh, because you mentioned that uh, several times during your presentation, particularly on we talk about the musical and when we talk about the um and this grotesque sort of film uh, or movie or whatever that was and and to me uh particularly the film uh, or the movie uh it shows um a way in which capitalism can appropriate uh post-human aesthetics right so in the sense that Whenever we talk about posthumanism, we understand this fusion uh, in different ways, but this fusion between technology and, and animals and becoming basically all these ideas that Rossi Bredotti says or states in, in the posthuman, becoming earth, becoming uh, technology, I think, uh, and beco becoming machines, sorry, and uh, becoming animal. And I was wondering what you think about, so reading uh, the cats movie in posthuman terms, don't you think that this is like uh, capitalism appropriating these dynamics just to show you and to entertain you with a product that might look like um, posthuman, uh, but it's definitely not posthuman and definitely does not reflect any posthuman sense of ethics? Great, um, great. Thank you for your uh, question, Alejandra. It's actually very, very interesting to, it would be very interesting to, to look at the film uh, from that perspective, definitely. So um, I actually, you just gave me an idea <laughs> for, yeah. for that, but yeah, I never asked it because um, I think that Cats, uh, both musical and the, the movie, um, I don't know, is what I said, it's like the epitome of a capitalist world. I don't know, for me, it's like the perfect uh, example of a capitalist world, both the musical, to be honest, both the musical and the movie, but the movie, which is more recent um, and cl closer to us in times, um, we can see that because definitely uh, there's this fusion, as you said, with the human and uh, digital um, and they try to combine both things and I, I definitely think that they what I said uh, that's why I said in my presentation that they I guess uh, Universal which is the um, product uh, the production company behind the movie um, so this film as a block or design the film as a blockbuster kind of thing because they have a huge budget and but then uh, with the CGI effects and everything, but it was really at the same time, it turned out to be really bad. They had lots of problems with the, the visual effects. And to, so yes, like they try to, I, I would say so, they try to incorporate that, they try to make a, yeah, a fusion of 
the post -hum it could be so it could definitely be so but uh it turned out for the worst to be honest because uh in in every in every in every respect because um box office uh it's not to be terrible but as, again as i said um the visual effects even even if they had a mind to to do something like um, they thought they were doing something great in that sense um it turned out that they didn't it was terrible <laughs> yeah and and, and uh, they could have even like since they use so much cgi they could have uh, basically changed the whole film like this has happened before i remember uh sonic the hedgehog uh the film uh, so basically they created this grotesque uh sonic and since people didn't really like it they just uh mm -hmm. basically remade the whole uh film or the whole cgi thing and they shape they basically changed the uh the, the sonic for a more uh, uh lovable one so uh, mm. I guess they could have even done it um, uh, with more money, with even more money spent on that. Uh, but yeah, um, yeah, I was also wondering or thinking about um, so this issue that we have discussed uh, previously in, in 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 this conference. So uh, the issue of uh, anthropomor anthropomorphism uh, and how it. So the way the, the effects it creates in in our minds, right? Like sometimes uh, it is used uh, as a way to humanize uh, animals, for instance, well, or, or always animals, uh, or, uh, basically animals, and it's used uh, as a way to uh, empathize with them, right? But in this film, uh, uh, as you can read for for some of the or in, in your in some of the 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 um, uh, comments that you have mentioned uh, in your presentation, basically it made people hate uh, cats actually, or even if it is just an exaggeration, but it definitely created this, this sense of detachment from those beings that aren't really cats and aren't really humans and aren't really anything, right? So um, yeah, I was uh, simply, this is just my mind uh, talking, uh, out loud, but uh, uh, it seems as if uh, this sense of anthropomorphism uh, is actually quite damaging if if we want to create some kind of, um, I don't know, uh, uh, empathic relationship with uh, with the cats, right, and or with the idea of cats that we've seen, or the, the purpose of depicting this, these cats in, in the movie. So, um, yeah, this was not really a question, actually, it's just me uh, talking out loud, but um, yeah, if you want to comment on that as well, uh, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you again for your comment, but yeah, because that's pretty much what I was thinking, and when I had to actually force myself to sit down and watch the movie, uh, which was something that I was trying for a long time, um, yeah, because again, yeah, this Mm, this kind of fixation with uh, anthropo anthropomorphism uh, to anthropomorphize uh, uh, animals, especially well in this case cats. But um, again, um, turn out for the worst because um, you get this kind of hybridity, which is which just looks weird. And as as you said, yeah, I, I wanted to show some of the comments or the reviews online because it was actually um, to me surprising to see people actually complaining about how they felt detached from the movie and, and they had this um, new kind of you know, feelings towards their own cats like is this what my cats look like or is this how they actually act or whatever but because it was um i don't know um the musical is different in that way because i guess it's the theater so when you go to the theater even if it's music it's a musical you get uh, you go with another perspective you know you're going to see humans pretending to be cats who are pretending to be humans but then it's a giant role play uh, and that's it but then the film, the movie is completely different because they try to combine them. They actually try to, the yeah, the technology they use because it's actually called like that, like um, digital fur technology, fur technology. They created this term for the film, 
they the the actors were um, were were in caption suits so and then the the fur was added on them digitally and then that's why you get this mix and you actually can see you can perfectly see that they are humans you can recognize the actors you see their faces you see who they are so yeah this anthropomorphism is kind of a hybrid yeah. products Mm. At the same time, I don't think they even so. Do cats need to be uh, anthropomorphic? Yeah, difficult. <laughs> it's more, more, yeah. More uh, to be anthropomorphized um, in order for us to. Um, for entertainment reason, yes. yeah. Mm, so, uh, Nieves, you have uh, something to say. Yeah, I have a question for Esther. Um, you said something I'm very intrigued about. You said that uh, the, the, the movie made uh, keepers uh, acquire new feelings towards their own cats. Can you elaborate on that? What new feelings are they experiencing towards their own cats? Um, I would say they would feel it. Um, well, based on the comments I read, I mean, the reviews from the audience, I mean, that, that could be another completely different research. <laughs> but yeah, they, they were commenting on how they felt that after seeing the movie, they felt um, uh, like they, 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 they didn't trust the cats the same way that they, they did before, like they, they saw them in a different sort of, from a different perspective, I guess. So more like, neg yeah, it was all like negative feelings. I guess it's exaggeration, of course, because you know, when you get this hate watching phenomenons and then people commenting and they are just negative comments and people like to, I guess people like also to exaggerate with these things, but there were, it wasn't just one comment that I read on that. I read the, uh, several comments from people saying they, they were cat owners, like they have cats. And after watching the movie, they, yeah, they got this different kind of, they didn't, yeah, like they didn't trust the cats and their behavior <laughs> like before. Very interesting because I I immediately connected to the idea of fear, and <laughs> something that is very present in commercials as well is this move from fantasy to fact and fact and fantasy all the time. Mm -hmm. They play with that a lot, and I am um, from what you were saying. It appears that the fantasy is is conditioning the facts as well. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> Great. So, and I have one uh, final question for uh, Gemma. Uh, because, uh, so you mentioned that, uh, so for all these evolution of uh, the depiction of the, of the black cat, um, there was this time in which it became more, um, more violent against the cat, right? And you showed this, uh, two images showing, uh, actually violence against, uh, the cat. And, uh, that made me think about, so our, I don't know if this is uh, the same in the rest of the world, and I know we have an international audience, but at least in Spain or in 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 rural Spain, I guess, uh, violence against cats uh, during the beginning and, and for most of the 20th century was uh, quite uh, normalized. So I do remember my, uh, my grandfather, for instance, uh, I don't know, uh, throwing stones at cats, uh, even when he was uh, 17 years old. And he had done that uh, during all of his life. And it was actually something normal to, to uh, exercise this violence against cats. Uh, and sometimes even against dogs, uh, not anymore, but um, uh, at least not uh, in the last 40 years, I guess. But, um, but violence against cats was something that was uh, highly normalized. And it just, uh, it seems ironic, right? Like the, the depictions of cats during that time uh, turned more violent. And uh, um, that was more of the time, I guess my, so my fathers and, and my, grandfather, my grandfather were well young. Um, so I don't know if you have found some sort of um, connection or in your research uh, uh, between this violence that was depicted 
uh, against animals and the actual behavior that people showed uh, with these uh, animals and how this disappearance uh, has uh, changed that in any way or another. This is just me speculating, uh, but I don't know if there is actual work on that or if you have found uh, doing the research some sort of connection between these two, uh, this, this cultural uh, attitude and this uh, cultural depiction of the cat. Well, that's a really good point because I have only focused on the relationship between the original tale and the illustration. So I think it has more, more to do with the artist, artistic currents because there is a general um, tendency on Spain in the late 19th century regarding the representation of the tales of Edgar Allan Poe. And it has to be with the the more the most classical or soft representations of the tales because the the black cat specifically has a lot of violence but there are a lot of um, pole tales which have like i don't know um, it is hard to explain <laughs> because there are a lot of terms but um for example in bernice or in morella there are a lot of murders and the protagonist um, usually do really hard stuff <laughs> to say it that way and it has become more violent with the with the past of the years because the artists have much more um, freedom to represent that kind of violence because of the audience that was going to to see that so that's why i have said that there's an evolution right because the classical tone that the first illustration have is really different from the for example maria espejo who is one of the my favorite we can see uh, she is one of my favorites because she represents the violence in a very cruel way like i don't know if you have read the telltale heart for example um, the traditional representation of the tale in Spain show like the protagonist talking to another people, to the police and that kind of things. But um, this author represents the exact moment of the murder. So I don't think that it has to do with the real moment of the violence that cats suffer because it will obviously there, there was um, the difference between the nowadays the the, the thing I don't know how to explain that the um, <laughs> sorry we have a lot of more sensibility regarding animals today and that was not going to happen in the in the first representation so it is not I think it's, it is not related but I didn't think of that I don't know if I have I am sorry for my never in, for my English level because I am nervous. Don't worry. I, I, <laughs> I am was, starting to. It was clear. Don't worry about it. Uh, so we <laughs> have one more question for you, Gemma, uh, in the chat. Uh, I will I will read it out loud. Uh, that comes from from Anna. Uh, what is the peculiarity of these uh, Spanish illustrations versus the black cat and its uh, original book? Uh, do you find the Spanish interpretation of the story somehow uh, brings something culturally specific to it? Well, I have I have not um, go deeper on on that topic because I have studied only the the Spanish illustrations and my PhD is based on Spanish illustrations, so I have seen other representation of the cat, for example, from Aubrey Bresley, I don't know if you know that artist, um, who represents the cat in a very creepy way. And I don't know if, if it has to be with the era because Aubrey Bresley is obviously later on time. And Sumetra, for example, it is from late 19th. So there's a, a difference between artists. And we, have, we also have to think about the, yeah, the moment of the of the country the Spain Spain was living of the moment and the people were were really sensitive 
so of some kind of things and maybe we can compare but i didn't do that sorry <laughs> i have only prepared those those illustrations but i think it has it has to do more with the artistic currents and the not not just the thinking of the era but it has more to be with the i have said that with the audience because people were not, not used to that kind of violence so we can see a, a evolution now we are used to violence because of the media or that kind that kind of stuff but yeah i think that that's a really good point and i thank you for your question i don't know who asked uh, it was it was anna uh, okay anna thank you so much so, I don't um, know if I have answered <laughs> properly. Um, well, uh, yes, definitely yes. Uh, I mean, it was it was definitely clear. I will. Um, I was just no. It's just uh, this question. So, uh, we have uh, two more minutes. Uh, if anyone wants to ask uh, something else, uh, you're very welcome to do it. If not. Um, I think we can wrap this up. It was, uh, oh, no, uh, Melissa, you uh, all of this. Um, so, Melissa, you have... Yeah, I, I apologize. I don't know if we have enough time to answer this or not, um, but it sounds like across all three presentations, there is the, these sort of tracking projects of how um, cats were once depicted and now are in their sort of present state, whether it's in advertising, film, or um, in illustrated media. And so I'm, I'm just curious, because we talked a bit about like the post-human in these representations, but I'm wondering if we're maybe coming to a moment where we're post-cat, right? So our conception of the cat has changed over, over time. And so I'm curious, you know, where do we see this going? Are we trending more towards recognizing cats as something maybe different than what we've thought of before? Are we recognizing their animality or their humanness in a way that we haven't considered? Or are we still falling into the trappings of, you know, relegating them to lesser than because they are animals? So, um, I don't know. And, and that's, that's, for, that's for the whole panel. So whoever wants to, to, to answer that. <laughs> So, um, so uh, yeah, so as far as I am concerned, I love the idea of the postcat. Mm, I think there's no the problem as I see it and just focusing on, on the kind of research that I have uh, conducted. I have um, dealt with cats in, in advertising. I have focused on gender and I have focused on this. So far, I think we have not made a lot of progress in my in my mind. So although I love very much the idea of post-cat, I think it's the same as pre-cat and cat itself. We have not moved anywhere. And in my case, to move from fear to guilt is not a great step forward. So so I don't know what the uh, other participants are going to say, but I, I don't see a lot of, of, of changes. And I was also thinking about Esther and the movie. And I see there's a lot, there's a lot of cats. Um, the cat is still associated to evilness, is associated to witchcraft. It is very much primitive. And from what Gemma was saying about the illustrations, I, I don't think, I really don't think we have made a lot of progress. So that's my take. And I think it, that was a very interesting question. Thank you. May I talk? <laughs> I don't know. May I talk? And may I answer? Yes, yes. Yes, please. okay, um, thank you. Well, I find your question extremely interesting because I have never listened, I have never seen the the concept of postcats. Like I think that in, in regarding my my topic, it is related with the the thing that was saying Nieves, um, and it has to do with symbol symbology, like for example, in in our imaginary, we related the, the cat with the witchcraft, the black magic and the witches, that kind of stuff. But I think that Poe gives the cat a really special meaning because um, he humanizes the animal so, and this dehumanizes the person. I don't know if I am explaining it correctly and if you are understanding, but 
um, for Po, at least in this tale, the human is an animal, is a beast, because um, he abuses his wife and he ends up uh, murdering her. And the cat is the only one that has like the uh, moral value and like he's even though even though the it is a non-speaking animal, he's always saying that uh, the things that the protagonist is doing are really wrong. And it's the only one that has moral and is the only one that is an animal. So I think that um, talking about post animalism i don't know if i am using the the words correct because that's not my topic <laughs> sorry but i think it's really interesting to compare the the nature of the animal and the nature of the human and um, it is sometimes mixed because the human is the really is only the the only being that practices violence and cruelty only because of that I, and i think that that was completely interesting and I really appreciate the contribution of, of Nieves and Esther because we can see the, the, the same topic from some different perspectives. So I am really glad to hear you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I appreciate your answers on this. Um, it, just to give a little context, I know we, we're trying to wrap up. Um, you know, this is coming out of a critical, critical animal studies perspective. You know, um, oftentimes, you know, we use dogs as the standard for thinking about posthumanism. Um, and, you know, some scholars have written about the potentiality of the cat because it, you know, it, sometimes cats are feral, they're not fully domesticated, they're slippery creatures. And so this is a really interesting panel for me just to see kind of all that slipperiness in all of these different media formats. Um, and so, yeah, I, you know, I often wonder, you know, have we, have we gone too far in, in thinking about the cat as human or as something else, as monster, as, um, you know, lap animal, things like that. But so thank you all for your wonderful presentations. Thank you. Well, and thank you, Melissa, for this uh, question. If, I mean, we, we can get, I guess, 10 more minutes of, uh, of Q&A if you, if you feel like. I don't know if, Esther, you wanted to say something on this last uh, thing or, or maybe. So, well, um, I actually, um, well, I found uh, Melissa's comment uh, very, well, her question is very, very interesting, fascinating to think about that. Um, but yeah, I tend to agree with Mieves, or at least um, on the movie side, I don't think we, we have transcended that. Yeah. So I think that um, what Hema was saying about Poe, yeah, I, I, I see what she, uh, what she means. And I guess that Poe was kind of ahead of his time when he was writing from that perspective. Yeah, because that, uh, the title is, it was really interesting to, to look at it that way. But in this case, in the adaptations that I'm focusing on, I don't, or at least in the movie for sure, um, I didn't think we have, yeah, we have left all those, um, yeah, and this stereotypes about cats uh, far behind us. I didn't think so. Hopefully we are moving forward, but who knows? <laughs> well, yeah, and I, I feel like, I, I mean, we could do a comparison in just the reviews alone, right? Like looking at how the critics responded to those depictions of cats, which are, you know, based in CGI versus like Puss in Boots and Shrek, right? Or even Garfield, right? Where the CGI was also there, but, you know, because they they play better with our you know, understandings of the aesthetics of cuteness in animals and, you know, the way we think of cats as maybe these whimsical little children that run around our house, you know, that gets better reception than um, the, I, I don't even know what you would want to call these, these human animal hybrids and, and cats um, that maybe don't quite gel with those stereotypes. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> You're right there. <laughs> And yet, uh, now that you mentioned that, Melissa, I, I, I just was wondering if, uh, if maybe this is the actual way of representing the post-human or the post-cat, uh, since uh, 
since basically the, the way we have uh, represented cats or the way we have understood cats in the past is through this lens of cuteness. Of course, th there is this other aspect of, of, of violence, but of course, now nowadays cats are basically cute things. So basically, if you, if you Google cat on, on Google images, you only get cute cats. Uh, and definitely you never get uh, very highly dangerous cats or, or, or tigers or whatever. So I was wondering if, or I, I was just thinking uh, now that you mentioned that, that uh, maybe if the post cat or the post human or, or this post subject uh, is meant to break those, uh, those frontiers, uh, these uh, ontological frontiers, maybe this grotesqueness is uh, the evolution, the actual evolution into a post-human cat or a post-cat or whatever we want to call it, right? Because it's it's no longer uh, cute. Uh, it's no longer uh, the idea that we previously had on cats. And it's something that we cannot even categorize in terms of power, uh, I guess. Uh, this is something that, again, I'm sort of improvising, so maybe we can uh, definitely see how uh, humanist power is uh, uh, exerted in the in the movie. But um, uh, it might be a, a good idea to explore, uh, now that I think about it, uh, the way in which this anti-cuteness uh, can be seen as post-human or as subversive in a way, even though, of course, in this case, it was unintentional, but uh, maybe we can do that kind of uh, reading. Um, I don't know if this makes sense or not, but um... I don't know. I I love that idea, especially you know thinking about like connecting Esther's um, presentation to to Yemma's here. Um, that grotesqueness, right, has a lot of potential to be subversive, and I think Poe Poe's well, the illustrations of Poe's work, you know, lend themselves to that grotesque mirror. And I think a very similar way that the CGI in Cats maybe unintentionally meant to. Um, and so like seeing, yeah, that, that, that grossness, if it goes too far, right? I don't know. I like that idea though. I think it's, it's a interesting possibility for subversion. Great. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's interesting how we start taking this, uh, the, this movie and then, uh, we finish this, this talk, uh, saying that you might actually be a subversive. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I think um, we are perfectly on time to wrap this up. Uh, I would love, uh, I would like to um, uh, thank you all uh, for coming here. Uh, I would like to uh, thank the speakers for their brilliant presentations and, and, and for uh, the, the, the debate that we have had here. Uh, we will be coming back in 15, 20 minutes uh, with uh, the next session of, uh, of the conference. But uh, um, again, thank you all uh, so much. And uh, yeah, I'll see you all and we will see each other uh, in, in a few minutes. Uh, you can actually, uh, so if you want to continue this conversation, uh, we have enabled uh, these other rooms, uh, these launch uh, rooms, uh, so you can share references or uh, keep the conversation. So um, yeah, again, uh, thank you all, and I'll see you all in in a few minutes.